Hello. The following interview with composer Kevin Putz and librettist Greg Pierce about their new opera, *The Hours*, was recorded on March 2nd, 2022, in anticipation of the concert version presented by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Indie Opera Podcast shares this interview now in support of the premier fully staged production presented by the Metropolitan Opera. Performances begin on November 22nd and run through December 15th. Please enjoy. This is Chuck Sachs for Indie Opera Podcast, and my guest today are composer Kevin Putz and librettist Greg Pierce. We'll be talking about the creation of their opera, The Hours, based on Michael Cunningham's Pulitzer Prize-winning novel and the award-winning Paramount Pictures film. Hello, Kevin and Greg. Hi. Good Hi. morning, and thank you for joining me. Pleasure. So, how did you two meet and decide to collaborate on this new opera? Well, I um, a few years ago, I don't know, four or five years ago, had been speaking uh, to Renee Fleming about uh, uh, doing an opera together. I had just finished um, uh, working on a, a, a pretty big piece for orchestra uh, and two singers based on the letters of Georgia O'Keeffe um, and Alfred Stieglitz, uh, which she was part of and really helped to develop um, <clears throat> and expand uh, into a bigger piece, uh, sort of multimedia piece. I, I, I mentioned the idea of, of doing an opera and I had one idea and she wasn't so into it. And she had just been uh, having lunch with Julianne Moore um, because she sang uh, the voice part for uh, for her in Bel Canto, the movie. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, it'd be, it'd be really great to do something um, that takes place like in three different times all at once, like the hours. And I said, well, what about the hours? <laughs> and um, so we, I, I, the more I thought about it, it really sounded very exciting and interesting. You know, um, I started thinking about the possibilities um, of that, that opera presents, you know, that really aren't, aren't possible in, in the, the really wonderful book or the film um, uh, that, you know, certain simultaneities can occur and overlapping of these, of these time periods as she was, as she called it. Um, and so anyway, sort of, it was this, you know, kind of a, a journey to get the rights for it, which we were able to do eventually. And then it, it came time to, yeah, like uh, finding a good librettist. And um, of course I knew about Greg um, and the Met uh, was very enthusiastic about his work and, and we talked and I just, I don't know, maybe Greg can <laughs> fill in more details, but I just, felt that Greg's voice um, and his enthusiasm really for the project, it was clear that he had been thinking about the possibility of the hours as an opera for many years. And that just sort of did it for me. And also Greg sent me some, um, some poems. Uh, for me, I, I, I kind of, I need the libretto to have poetry in it. You know, that's really, I think what inspires, um, inspires me um, among other things, uh, of course, besides just the situations that are, that are inspiring for a composer in an opera. But I, I really loved what, what I read of Greg's and uh, that was about it, I think. <laughs> Maybe Greg can remember more details. Yeah, yeah, I just remember being, um, so I had done this, this opera, Fellow Travelers with Gregory Spears and, um, and the Met had approached me about doing a project for them. So I, I'd been talking to Paul Cremo, who's head of um, new works at the Met. And, um, and so we'd been trying to find something for a while. And then I was out in, uh, at Minnesota Opera in Minneapolis um, with a production of, of Fellow Travelers. And, and this, this came my way and Kevin and I started, um, started talking. And I think it was, it was kind of ostensibly a, a conversation to sort of um, get to know each other, see if we were a good fit uh, creatively. But I, I felt like from the first conversation, we were like off and running. It almost felt like we were already writing from that first. <laughs> and so I, I left that first conversation thinking like, I really hope he likes me because I'm like, I feel like I'm already doing this project. I already have it, <laughs> you know? Um, so it just, uh, and then from there, we we actually wrote very fast. We were both just really excited about it. And that that first summer we were really took off. Well, I mean, you at fellow travelers, in a sense, 
was also a period piece. So you're already used to um, working in that style. And mm -hmm. uh, certainly some, there may be some similar um, issues that are approached, not the lavender scare, but in terms of how um, gay people had to hide during their, um, their being during certain periods. Absolutely. It's funny. I mean, of, of course you're right. Um, I, I've never thought of that because once I'm finished with a project, I completely put it aside and get immersed in another project. And there's never a part of my brain that's like, how does this compare mm -hmm. to the other one? But I, you're, you're absolutely right. Yes. And you know, Teller Travelers is now being um, developed for a series with Matt yeah. Gomer, which is, that's exciting because it's the work definitely needs to keep getting out there and the story. Um, so it was a great confluence of events that you were both thinking about, um, that Renee got um, Kevin thinking about it and you were already thinking about it. That's exciting. Um, now, what made you choose to adapt the story and base it? Well, we know what made you choose to adapt the story, but you had to do the adaptation on the book and the movie. Is that because Paramount Pictures held the rights both ways? Or is there things that are different in the movie that, um, or changes that worked better than the book? There were no real stipulations about this must be, this must be, it really mm -hmm. was, you know, using Cunningham's story as a base, really delving into to everything. It was great that we had access to, you know, to all of that. And, and also to, to Mrs. Dalloway, to Virginia Woolf's novel, Mrs. Dalloway, um, which inspired the Cunningham novel, The Hours, if, for people who haven't read it, but um, so we just had all of this stuff. We had way more stuff that we could than we could use. All this incredible mm -hmm. poetry and these mm -hmm. wonderful scenes and all of these characters and everything. So it was really a uh, a process of trying to figure out which which themes and and characters to kind of pull um, to the to the front and. Um, and, and what to develop, because obviously in, in an opera, it takes so much longer to, to sing something than to say something. You have to be very selective um, about the material you're including and not try to do too much. Mm -hmm. Now, did that mean you also had to get the rights to Mrs. Dalloway, the novel itself? No. No. All right. Um, so you were talking about this and Paul Cremo talked to you. Um, is that, the, that was the next impetus uh, and the actual commission? Well, I th actually, Renee uh, brought it to, to Peter Gelb and mm -hmm. um, and she, you know, I sort of figured that was a lark to be <laughs> to, to, to use an appropriate expression. Um, and uh, but then she said, you know, I think he seemed enthusiastic. Um, you know, you might want to set up a meeting with him. And I just did. Of course, I'm going to do it. You know, um, I didn't figure it would go anywhere. I, I just figured, you know, he was kind of being nice and he had the next 15 years planned out and et cetera. But I, I set up this meeting, and and he um, he had, he said he had watched the the video of my first opera, Silent Night, and he liked it. And he he said, uh, and I said, well, anyway, I just want to thank you for you know entertaining this possibility. Uh, you know, it's nice to meet you and everything. And he said, I said, I assume you've you've got you know the next you know several years figured out, and it's hard to find a place. He said, well, actually, we have a place for it. We'd like to do it. So I was just you know, it's one of those those conversations that it was just surreal and I, I i couldn't believe it and then you know just a, maybe a couple of weeks later um he was already talking about casting the other parts and and you know and the ideas that he had were equally surreal and unbelievable to think about these three ladies uh, all in the same opera and also is um then it became the confluence because it's not just the met it's a co-commission Mm -hmm. Was that through Gelb and Yannick that it came to Philadelphia Orchestra? Yeah, yeah. that that um, Yannick really wanted to, you know, to really play a role in the piece, not just to do it at the Met, but you know, sort of be part of the development of it and in, in, in whatever capacity he was able to. Um, and he just didn't really have time, you know, to do it somewhere at another opera company. Um, so he thought, well, maybe we could, you know, begin. A tradition of of developing operas with the Met and the Philadelphia Orchestra and presenting them there. So that this is the first time they've they've uh, tried such a thing. It'll be interesting to see. You know, it's not. I mean, I think it's being billed as a concert version, but there's really nothing 
there's nothing change. I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're playing the opera. So, um, well, it'll be, you know, without a staging and um, mm -hmm. on the stage of the Kimmel Center. So. I, I, I know it, it's, I'm, I was hoping to get down there, but it was, it was strange because it just, when they first listed it, it's like, they just listed you. They didn't list the, uh, the, in the first releases I was reading and it's like going, well, who's the librettist? Is the librettist? Yeah, you know, we, we had and, to get that. Yeah, we got and I was so glad to then find out it was Greg Pierce because I've Absolutely. admired his work for so, so many years already. Um, and that's exciting. I mean, cause I mean, Philadelphia Orchestra is, as we know, one of the premier groups in the country. And then to have Yannick working all that time um, to develop it with you is, um, is really exciting and and it's it's great to see that further support yeah of the new work so i have to say unfortunately i have not read the book i have not even seen the movie um but i did really uh, read a fairly detailed outline on wikipedia of the book mm -hmm. i mean it's fascinating it's confusing because it's stream of uh, part of the book is and part of uh is stream of consciousness because uh, um, Cunningham um, parroted the style of Mrs. Dalloway, which just also deals with characters that go in a stream of consciousness. Um, how, how do you deal with that? Um, well, one of the things that Michael Cunningham did that I think is so brilliant is um, is is he he does employ that stream of consciousness stuff that that can be that can be really confused, you know, can be hard mm -hmm. to follow who's talking to him, but he, he has a way of making things crystal clear when he needs to, who's speaking and what's the tone and what, and, but also um, he's just a, he's just a wonderful poet and, and he can, um, he can sort of do both things at once. It's, it's, um, it's pretty miraculous. So it's, it's, um, it's a it's a challenge to do that in three dimensions, you know, to do that in an opera and to tell three simultaneous stories and um, to have people to have a world in which people can speak directly to each other, but also we can hear their inner thoughts. And we have a great director, um, Fela McDermott, who's um, and and that's you know one of his one of his main jobs with this project is to uh, really make those things crystal clear: what's happening and what are we listening to and who. Mm -hmm. Now, before we continue on, can you, Greg, give me, give us a brief um, plot line of the story? You know, I, I know it's not easy, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, it's not. I, I, it's not. It's not easy. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll give you a few sentences, which is basically it's a day in the life of um, of these three women in three different time periods, and it's a story about the ways in which their uh, emotional lives um, intersect as they struggle with some very similar um, themes. So it's, we're, we're talking about Virginia Woolf. Um, while she's writing Mrs. Dalloway, we're, uh, we're talking about um, Laura Brown, who's right at the, uh, almost in the, right at the end of the forties. And then um, Clarissa Vaughn, who is um, living right before the turn of the last century, so the late nineties. So these, these three time periods, three women. And, and there's further connections because um, Laura's son become is becomes. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of reveals. Yeah. There's all sorts of things that happen, but um, some of it we want the the audience. Okay. don't want to talk about it too much. Yeah. Yes, plus if you read the book, you'll you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you're dealing with multiple time periods um, that alternate throughout this book. Um, I mean, obviously, we have specific characters that are only in each timeline, so that helps in um, the audience identifying what, who is, what we're going on. But did you attempt to differentiate these um, different timelines with your language and musical styles? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, the actually, I heard of an interview with Philip Glass a long time ago. He was talking about the approach to writing the score for the hours, and and his approach was that there would be one kind of music which would sort of unify or would, you know, bring together the entire, um, you know, narrative in, in, in these three three different periods. My approach uh, was was not the same. I mean, I, I really did set up a kind of uh, 
vocabulary for each each situation really sort of I think of them as sort of musical environments they're not like you know it's not not like a light motif or anything like that but it's just a kind of style which um is in the harmony and in the orchestration and and other uh, other elements that kind of uh signifies the certain the various situations that the three uh the three characters are in. and of course then there are, there are moments when they they come together and they they live sort of or they they exist sort of outside of time and space and that requires a uh, yet another kind of music. I mean, I wasn't too heavy handed. I don't think about, about this, you know, um, but definitely um, I, I, I was aware of, of distinct kinds of music um, for each of the characters. same goes for you Greg because they're completely different periods and mor mores um, and, and even, even language styles. Definitely but it's also not a play you know it's also an opera and mm -hmm. so um, I have to sort of um, take that into account that, the, that there are these different time periods but also it, it needs to be sung you know and there's we use a lot of repetition so a libretto is different from a play in that there mm -hmm. tends to be shorter more poetic phrases and that that sort of language world tends to unite the characters but you know also just with Virginia Woolf if you if you listen to her talk she speaks in these very long complex kind of ornate sentences and you just can't I I, I didn't make any attempts to right you know um, create a libretto that's exactly how she how she actually spoke so I I was trying to kind of capture the essence and what was kind of going through her mind or phrases she might have used fragments and things like that but um, but leave this sort of naturalism to another genre. Cool. Um, so. When and when you finally sat down, you said it it went move very fast. About, I mean, uh, did you work? Did you sit down and do an outline together? Um, what was the process in in beginning this and moving it forward? Well, you know, I, it's interesting. I just read, I just reread the hours um, because uh, you know while Greg was working on it, um, my philosophy is to sort of let it go, you know, and not be like, well, what about this? And what about this? And, you know, uh, and just let the libra let, you know, Greg do his thing and not have too many cooks and all that, um, which I think I did pretty well. Um, <laughs> Greg had a test <laughs> whether or not that's true. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I just, I think that that's, that's the way to go. And then also for me to approach the libretto uh, totally independently, you know, not with any like, you know, preconceptions about what I needed, I what thought I wanted to do with the story or anything. I may have had those ideas, but the libretto, it, you know, needs to be addressed, you know, uh, as an independent um, document or, you know, entity. And, and mm -hmm. so I, I tried to do that. But it's been really interesting, actually, to reread um, the book after maybe four years now. And, um, and, and I, I just feel like what Greg did is, is brilliant, because he, you know, it, because I realize now what what he you know what he drew from the book um, pretty closely, and then what other things he did um, that were more uh, I would say more influenced by Mrs. Dalloway, or or he brought more of that book in I think to our opera, and also the style maybe of Virginia Woolf's uh, prose as well uh, in a certain sense. So yeah, so in a sense, it was completely the Bretto first. At least a draft. Oh yeah, yeah, right yeah, out. for sure, absolutely, yeah. That's the way. I, that's the only way I can. I can work. I, in a sense, that's the way generally musicals are written. Is that they? I mean, they talk about it, but then the librettist goes, um, book writer goes off and writes it, and then they start tearing it apart and mm. reconfiguring it mm. in many yeah. respects. <clears throat> um, so, in terms of that, Greg, I, I know we talked about language, but because it's it goes between, in a sense, reality and stream of consciousness. Uh, did you 
change and modify your language depending which way they were. I know it's all sung, but still, I mean, was uh, is the stream of consciousness more poetic or? Um, uh, I, I think when I was, I think I was using my own sort of um, experience as a kind of basis for this of like, you know, we're having a conversation. So I'm saying th certain things in a certain way, but I also have an inner conversation happening. And that's a little bit more fragmented, more repetitive. Um, I'm not necessarily speaking in poems in my head, but it does seem to be a different, uh, a different thing happening. So trying to pay attention to, to that. Um, and also just this idea of when we when we say something and we maybe we think we sound stupid and that thing just kind of keeps cycling and keeps cycling. We're trying to move forward with our day, but part of our mind is stuck at 10.07 when I said that dumb thing. And, and I think that that's happening a lot in the hours too, just a constant um, push and pull between moving forward through a day, but then constantly cycling back, not only through the day, but through, through a life. And, and is that streaming consciousness dealt with by the character who's who's already in there or is it is there uh are, is the choir or some other kind of alternate voice used at all that's going to be a big surprise okay <laughs> that that's fine we want to leave them for some prizes um and is there anything else further you want to tell me about the project I don't think so. I mean, the only thing is one thing that is so exciting to me about this project mm -hmm. is it brings together um, a bunch of artists. Some of them are making their um, Met debuts, like Andy mm -hmm. B. Parson is um, choreographer and just all of these incredible artists who I think some people maybe wouldn't imagine working with each other or it wouldn't be their mm -hmm. first thought. And so that some people are coming from different worlds. Um, I'm relatively new to the opera world and, uh, and Annie, and, and I, I just think it's really, I think it's really exciting because I can see how each one of these artists um, has a very specific contribution and can make this a much uh, richer world. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to working That's with everyone. Right, I mean, so we we have Renee Fleming, we have Kelly O'Hara, and in Philadelphia, it's going to be Jennifer Johnson Kano, but at the Met, is it, it's Joyce DiDonato, correct? Right. Um, and uh, some amazing uh, male singers, too. Um, I know I, I spoke to William Burden recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Richard Troxell. Mm -hmm. And then you have children. Yeah, we have children. That's going to be that. I think I, I keep looking forward to that. I think that'll be really fun uh, to, to work with kids. I mean, I have, a, I have a, an 11 year old myself. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be fun. But and Bill Burden actually was in my first opera, um, Silent Night, and Richard Troxell was in uh, Elizabeth Cree. So I know I know a lot of these singers from other projects. Um, um, and uh, it's yeah, it'll be great to, to work with them. Now, I mean, going back to Renee Fleming, since she kind of you, Kevin, and she had this kind of conversation. Did she have, um, was she involved in any of the development of it further in terms of talking with you or, you know, discussing uh, melodic lines where, you know, what Absolutely. worked for her? Absolutely, I work very closely with her. I, I know her pretty well now, I know her voice, um, but it's always interesting to hear her sing things in different ways and and to, you know, Sort of sculpt the the lines for to, to her voice. Um, I mean, she does many things so beautifully. Um, but I I can tell when she's really happy with something, when she feels something really sits well. Um, so and as yeah, so I'd say I've worked uh, more closely with her on this than than any any part in one of my operas. It, it's I've been excited to watch her as she's sort of semi retired from opera, and the the project she's been working on, and it really just shows she can do as we call is a really great crossover artist mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. she just brings a natural um a naturalness to her mm -hmm. singing mm -hmm. and that you just always feel it's grounded and it's and she's really there with it yeah mm -hmm. so thank you both for talking with me um and in closing why don't you share where the upcoming production is and then what's the next step for your opera which i know but Let's let it come from you. Uh, so, well, 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> uh, so we got uh, two uh, concert versions at uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, March 18th, um, that's a Friday, and Sunday, March 20th. Uh, and then we will be um, doing a workshop over the summer, and then we will debut at the uh, Metropolitan Opera on November uh, 22nd. And that's exciting, and it's already on my schedule. Great. Thank you. But, so have a great morning. Okay, thank you so much.